Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm so happy to be with all of you here tonight, and especially because I was able to bring two friends of mine to share a little bit about their experience with us tonight. So we have here Rabbi Juan Mejia, who will introduce himself later in more detail, and he's speaking directly from Oklahoma City right now and where he's the director of education at the local school. And also my friend, the new Schechter, who right now is in New York, but we never know when the next, where the next stop is. He has been traveling a lot over the years and speaks Portuguese beautifully. Juan also has a, a actually good Portuguese, at least understands pretty well, pretty well. Then you married a Brazilian woman from Rio. So he actually speaks like with very interesting accent. And we actually were talking about maybe doing this all in Portuguese, but um, I thought it'd be nice to have a little bit in English as well. So I'm going to do a quick introduction so we can all know more or less what are we going to be talking about tonight. And then I want to pass the ball to them um, to share a little bit about their experiences. So we shared that we're going to be learning about Jewish emergent communities. What is that? So the simple definition is a community where most or all of the members did not grow up Jewish. This is a very simple way to put it. And then you might ask, so what's their story? And then we have to start telling every single community story because they're all different. It's very unique how we see some patterns and we're gonna talk a little bit about those and, and some trends. At the same time that every community's history is very unique. It depends which country they are in. It depends where, what their background is, what kind of access they have to information, to internet, who of the Jewish community have been there before. And those communities are gonna look very different from each other. So one phenomenon we're going to be talking a little bit about in this call is a phenomenon that is particular to Latin America, but it's not unique to Latin America. It does have its own ways of, of appearing in other places of the world, which is connected to the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition about 500 years ago, where many people were converted by force um, to Christianity. And some of them, um, officially converted because they wanted to live, but never really converted and remained practicing Judaism hidden from society. Some of these people were called the Anusim. Anusim literally means the forced ones, those who were forced. And is a technical term that actually appears in Jewish law. Someone who is Anus is someone who is not free to perform a certain um, mitzvot. And their descendants are called the Bnei Anusim. So the children of those Anusim. So you might hear Anusim, Bnei Anusim um, in this kind of conversation. Um, there are other names that I'm not a huge fan of. I don't know if our friends are gonna share their takes on. For example, conversos, which literally means in Spanish, those who converted. Um, or my least favorite one, Maranos, or Machanos as we would say which um, Juan maybe can clarify that, but I think it's related to the word pig, right? And Yes, it means swine. Uh, there's there's some some people, particularly in Portugal, have been trying to like rescue it. Oh no, it's more Anu, it's Aramaic. Like, no, no, the, the Inquisition did not speak Aramaic. They were calling you a pig. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, that was the first term that was used. Uh, Sir Cecil Roth, History of the Moranos, was the first English work on, on this community. So unfortunately, it's been uh, a term that is problematic to begin with, but yes. And yeah. hi! Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> please, please, we're happy you did. Um, so this is another term you might see around um, as well. I usually use Benio to see my thing, Benio and Rabbi Mejia as well, um, and, and we're going to go with, with that. So this is a unique phenomenon that is related to 
countries that were colonized by Portuguese and, and Spanish people. But the phenomenon of Jewish emergent communities, of communities who everybody or most of them are converting to Judaism is not unique to that history. You're gonna see in Asia, you're gonna see in Africa actually, very interesting groups. Um, some trying to recall their history since the times of the temple in Israel. For more than 2000 years, they try to reconnect with that Jewish identity. And some that openly say, actually we have no ancestry, no Jewish ancestry whatsoever, but we learn about Judaism and we love it and we wanna do it. One of the most famous cases about that is the Abayudaya community in Uganda, right about a hundred years ago, there was a mass conversion there. And since there for about a hundred years, they've been living as Jews and learning what that means um, with their resources. Um, but no one there claims that they have that kind of ancestry. Here in the US, you are gonna see some of that same phenomenon we see in Latin America in some states, especially in the South, in New Mexico, in Texas, in Arizona, you see a little bit of the Spanish speaking communities um, having that as well. Um, and all over the world, many things can happen. Another similar case that is happening in Brazil is not necessarily because of the Jewish ancestry, but because of their evangelical background they became very interested in Judaism. Some specific evangelical groups, in particular in Brazil, they are what people call philo-Semites. They are friends of the Semites, friends of the Jews, right? They like Judaism. They start having Israeli flags all over the place and they start trying to wear talitot. I'll give an example, the major new Pentecostal evangelical church in Brazil, the universal church, Bispo Macedo, the main bishop of the city, of, of, the, of the church, um, inaugurated his largest church ever that sits 10,000 people. You know what's the name of that church? It's called Solomon's Temple. What? How can that be? Yeah, he brought stone from Jerusalem to build it because he wanted it to look like the temple. And guess what? He was wearing talit and kippah in the inauguration of that church. And I was there to see it. So we're gonna tell a little bit about our, our stories today and how we connect with those communities, how we got to discover that they exist and what kind of work we are currently doing in all of that. And it's very fit that we're doing that online because the new and one and I, we've been virtual friends for five, seven, eight years more, I don't know, doing that kind of stuff. And I think I've only seen each one of them once in my life in person, right? And we're still in, 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 in touch and, and, and learning together. I've been collaborating with Daniel for over a decade and I haven't hugged them once. Yeah, never, is... never, never seen you. Yeah, it's been uh, since I think 2010 or so. Um, we've, been, we've, we've been living in this world way before than, than, yeah. than most. So it's... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's a very common thing in the, this kind of work that is so isolated and it's not something that the mainstream Jewish community is picking on and you're having hundreds of seminars about that and conventions like we would be there uh, if that was the case. But unfortunately, with a few exceptions and one was in Israel speaking about that very recently, um, this is still something very, very small. So I'll get started passing to the new to share with us a little bit about himself, how he got into that kind of work, how he discovered that all of that exists and to some uh, special cases and places you visited that you wanna tell us about, maybe show us some, some pictures about your trips as well. Sure thing. Hey everybody, um, welcome, glad to be here. Um, I am going to have to leave after about uh, 30 or so minutes. So I just want to share my contact. My, my email is my name. It's daniel.schechter at gmail. So if you have any further questions or want to hear more, I'm always happy to, to chat or, or share pictures or, or anything like that. So just wanted to, um, to share that. Um, so I'm from New York. I'm a 100% Ashkenazi Jew. Uh, my 23andMe DNA test was not very interesting when I did it. Um, and about 15 years ago, I got really interested in Latin America. Um, it was uh, 15, yeah, my, my senior year in, in high school um, in, in, uh, in New York. And 
I was at, I was attending a conservative shul uh, in Manhattan and actually it was an Abba Udaya uh, visitor um, from the, the Ugandan community came and, and I found out about this organization called Kulanu um, that uh, that was supporting, uh, working with communities like that as well as some in Latin America. And um, over the next decade, uh, I spent a lot of my time, a lot of my waking hours, summers, um, a little of everything, uh, really interested in and in kind of fallen in love with with all of these communities. Um, you know, first, it was La uh, Spanish speaking Latin America. Um, so that's where Rabbi Mejia and I, uh, you know, connected. And um, I really was just so intrigued. There's so many Jews in the US who don't care about Judaism and seeing these groups um, you know, across from Nicaragua to uh, Barranquilla to Colombia to uh, Juanuco, Peru, uh, you know, all over. And, and then later I, I discovered uh, the communities, I don't say discovered, but I became acquainted with the communities in Brazil as well. Um, and it's just been so amazing to learn from them over the years to try to teach, uh, to connect them with other, um, you know, Jewish institutions in, in those countries and, and globally. And so, um, yeah, I spent uh, a lot of time doing that. And then I, I wrote my thesis on, on this uh, undergrad uh, about Ecuador in particular. Um, and I guess, you know, I then ended up doing a Fulbright scholarship in Brazil, uh, which, which led me uh, to the Brazilian communities and was very lucky to be based in Recife, in Recife, as, as they say, um, which has a, a, really, a really important uh, piece of, of history in the Anusim and you know, the, the spreading of, of Judaism to the new world. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into too much in depth, but, um, you know, also happy, happy to answer questions. I'm sure uh, Nathan and, and Rabbi Mejia can, they can both share more um, later. But um, yeah, I mean, the Northeast of Brazil was where the, the Dutch conquered uh, in, in the 17th century, like the, the, the TLDR, the, the very brief one minute version is, um, you know, it, Essentially, a lot of the uh, Jews were, were in hiding. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, new Sephardic Jews from, from Europe were able to come over and, and practice. Uh, and I think for about 50 years or so, several decades, there was religious freedom in the northeast of Brazil, Hesifi, which was, was the capital. And so um, the oldest synagogue in the New World, I believe, is, is Kahal Tzur, which is based in Hesifi. Um, and, and so then once the Portuguese won uh, and, and kind of took back over, a lot of these folks went into hiding. Um, and that's why the surrounding states and, and cities are, are such a hotbed for Anusim um, communities. So I, I'm going to pause there from, from a historical uh, perspective, put that away, you know, put that behind us and, and they can comment on it more. Um, but I think, you know, a couple of the things that, that I want to share is, you know, I think I mean, Natan was talking about on a seam and, and a lot of these evangelical groups who also kind of these uh, who have been turned on to Judaism and in one um you know I'll say my, my hot take um you know in, in in today's lingo is that for me it never mattered whether somebody could prove to me that their last name was on a list um that you know of Sephardic origin or whether they were I know Rabbi Mahi and I agreed a lot about this um or whether they just wanted to be Jewish right whether they had their evangelical church, they, they started thinking about, uh, you know, tzitzis and, and, and wearing a talit, and then had some kind of philosophical, you know, theological realization that they didn't believe in, in Jesus Christ anymore, and that they wanted to, to learn about Judaism. And for me, it was always, I was not judgmental, and I wanted to help them in the way that they, that they can. And so I'm not, I'm the only member of this panel who is not a, a rabbi. Um, I'm not affiliated with the movement. Um, I'm pluralist. And I, my goal was always to help them in a way that, that, you know, that they wanted to be helped. Um, and I don't want to make it an I versus, you know, like a, a student teacher relationship. It was, you know, there was mutual helping. There was, you know, growing, but I, I really wanted to, um, yeah, pr provide and, and really create relationships and connect them. And so I'll give a couple of um, you know, uh, what's, uh, a couple of examples, and then I want to just leave maybe a couple minutes for questions on anything I've said, um, and then I'll I'll sign off. So, so a couple of of you know, does that work just in terms of, of timeline? Yeah, like like 10, 10 15 ish minutes. Okay. Um, I've I've done some you know some 
things that, you know, looking back are, are kind of crazy. You know, I, I went to the middle of nowhere, Peru uh, for a summer um, while I was a student at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania um, with a rabbi from Texas or a former rabbi from Texas uh, who's known in these worlds. And he asked me to give bar mitzvah classes to a, an orphan in a remote city that doesn't have a, an official Jewish community. Um, and to prepare the entire, you know, about 10, 15 folks for conversions. And then at the end of the summer, um, he, uh, myself, and one other halachic Jew, um, we did uh, about six or seven, um, you know, uh, conversions uh, processes. Um, it was the first time that I was I was on a, a Beit Din, uh, on a reform one, and um, definitely a unique experience spending, you know, eight, nine weeks in Huanuco, Peru. Um, so that, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting experience. Um, you know, and, and another another one that that you know I, I think most recently, given that I've spent a lot of time in Brazil in the last uh, seven eight years, um, I'll share a couple of of quick slides, um, touching on a bit of the northeast that I had mentioned, um, and so say and then I'll and I'll pause for some questions. So uh, Recife Recife is uh, this coastal city, this dot. Um, you know, and th these are the, uh, you know, the, the neighboring states in Brazil in the Northeast, um, that's the ocean. Um, and it was just, it was an extremely incredible opportunity um, for me to learn to, to conduct oral histories. Um, and a lot of people I've, I've noticed have some sort of in the sense, they feel like they need to prove that they have roots. And this goes back to what I was saying. And, and to me, I think it's it's part of the desire to belong with something and, and not to be judged because for so many decades they have been judged by folks who uh, who you know don't believe that they're Jewish or if they're whether they're not Jewish you know don't want to create a path for them to become Jewish. Uh, more importantly, and so um, I'll just share a couple of of uh, of these. This is one I believe actually that that Rabbi Nathan spent a, a couple of weeks in, maybe a month. Um, in the northeast and uh, near Fortaleza in, in Serra. Um, and I, I think these communities range, right? Many of them in, in Brazil that I've noticed tend, because they're viewing themselves as a, you know, a Sephardic community and because oftentimes they've come from previously evangelical world, which is, is a bit more lowercase conservative, they oftentimes end up with some kind of Judaism that they're practicing that is, is pretty close to a Sephardic Orthodox. Um, so even though some of these folks probably didn't, didn't, don't have a, a conversion um, like you and I might, might think, um, you know, they are, they're darn religious, you know, you look at them and, you know, they, they were at sit seat and they, you know, pray many, you know, several times a day. And um, it was, it was, it was very interesting to see the ways that they had adapted um, their, their Judaism. What, one uh, example I remember is a, a community, this was actually in, in Ecuador, telling me that they, right, there's a halachic interpretation that you're, that you're not supposed to, in many conservative schools, uh, Orthodox, not play musical instruments. Um, why? Be, you know, because you might come to fix it. There's many reasons, but there, that's one of the, uh, you know, accepted reasons. And so this community actually had a second guitar Back up, just in case the first one broke. Right, they they look orthodox. They had big big yarmulkes and tzitzit, but they, you know they even used a projector to you have the sidur on on the wall. Like it, it was it you know it, it was an incredible, interesting, very interesting experience. Um, but you know then would would be very right wing, uh, you know very orthodox on many other things. So this is something that you you know rarely counting women and minion things like that, which I know Rabbi Mejia will will touch on later. His communities are are drastically you know, different in, in uh, generally in, in that sense. Um, so just, you know, th this one is, is the is Sephardi, uh, Jewish Sephardi Society of Serra. About, uh, oops, uh, at the time there were about 40 or 50 folks um, and, you know, non-EGAL here, they actually, uh, they, they had separate seating, but no mechitza, no, you know, wall or separator. Um, and at the time they, they counted 10 converted men for a minion. So um, you know, interesting, they uh, actually, at the time, 40% of them had converted to Judaism with a JTS, a conservative rabbi. But the line of Judaism that they were following was one that was much more observant than, uh, you know, it, 
then maybe then it, then a conservative rabbi might feel comfortable converting. But in Brazil, Orthodox conversions are outlawed. Nathan, you, you want to jump in? I want to jump in just to share yeah. how unique that case is. So Roberto Cosme, who is there in the picture on the right, uh, he nowadays lives in Israel. He managed to uh, make Aliyah and pursue an Orthodox conversion. He was always very open about that. He said, I am converting conservative, aiming for the orthodoxy, and really use the conservative movement as a, a way to get to Israel so then he can get to an orthodox conversion, which was his personal goal from the beginning. Not everyone in his community thinks like him to the fact that the community still exists there, and some people remain in a very similar way as the new has, has mentioned. And as also you mentioned that the conversion process for a JTS ordained rabbi who is not even in the city, like how can they do a conversion somewhere else, right? It wasn't a great conversion that in a process that we liked uh, to the point that this rabbi um, has been questioned by the movement to understand better what is actually happening and make sure that we are more careful about the conversion we do. It's not to say that the conservative movement doesn't want to do that kind of conversion, but that we need to do the due process uh, throughout the the learning yeah. part. And, and that's an interesting thing just to touch on that, you know, throughout my 10 plus years working with this, I've heard and seen many countless cases of rabbis, not, 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 neither of the two here in this call, but of rabbis taking advantage of, of very vulnerable people who want to be Jewish, want to be viewed as Jewish and will pay money for it, you know, a lot of money and, and you know, in very questionable conversion processes where they're then told, no, you can't make Aliyah or no, you can't go to the other conservative or, you know, the, the shul. So Rabbi Me, you want to jump in? I just want to, uh, because I think there is a key piece of information uh, th that I think is missing. The reason these people are reaching out to rabbis in areas far away or even abroad or in Israel is because A, many places do not have Jewish communities. Yes. That is most... Mo Jews in Latin America tend to congregate in the big cities. They tend to be uh, financially buoyant communities, some of them extremely wealthy, like uh, New, uh, Me Mexico City. Uh, and the reason these people cannot convert through normal means is because without exception, every single country in Latin America has outlawed conversions. Yes. Uh, Includes conservative, includes orthodox. No one, no one in the established Jewish communities that have like have been there for a hundred years, fifty years, thirty years, whatever. They are not interested in these folks. Not the ones that claim Jewish ancestry. Not the ones that are not claiming. There is no interest, and that is why there is this black market, this desperation, yes. and also, but also the great blessing of great motivation leads to innovation. Like the way these communities have embraced the internet uh, pales. Like they had no problem adapting to COVID. They have been doing things differently because they had no other choice because the local Jewish communities do not want them to convert. That is that is a key piece of information that I think puts a little bit more into context. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe add a, also yeah. a personal anecdote. When I was the rabbinic intern in my community in Brazil in 2012, 13, 14, um, one of the, he was not a, a rabbi yet. He was in a, a, like a ritual director position. Now he's a rabbi. He brought this idea. And he want, we were the largest synagogue in Brazil. Like if not us, who can have the resources to help those communities? He was shut down immediately, right? The community was like, no, why bother? We have more than a thousand families here who need your attention, go talk to them. We don't need to take care of it. So this is a little bit of what Robin Mejia is saying is that it's not in the interest of those communities to use their resources to send their rabbis and, and leaders to, to help those communities. I see Naomi has a question, then back to the new. I was just wondering if you could talk more about conversion being outlawed. What, what is that? Uh, so I would, 
I would say there's two parts and then I'm going to let Rabbi Mejia and, and uh, Rabbi Nathan speak more to it. I think I would say the hesitation and the closedness of the Jewish communities in Latin America is based on socioeconomic and racial factors that I would, that I, I wouldn't, I, yeah, it's, it, it calls spade a spade. That's what it is. Uh, and every country I've, I've been uh, to and, and spent time in, whether it's the Syrian, you know, the, the Syrian communities that are, are pr pretty closed or the wealthy Ashkenazi communities, there is a sense of, you know, us versus them. I think there's a bit of, um, you know, in many of these Latin American countries, the Jewish community is very Zionist and a large, you know, a good amount make Aliyah, a good amount are also uh, assimilating. And I think there is a bit of a fear of the Anusim or the, uh, the you know, the groups that are converting um, that at some point, you know, essentially it, the Jewish community will become a bit more of a this sounds really, really strong, but maybe like a welfare state, right? Where there are this, this, you know, strong, wealthy, you know, Jews, and we, you know, we're paying for for folks who who look different than us, who are are newcomers, and you know, to to be there. Well, I, I usually don't know more religious, You're extremely correct. religious, in a way that is sometimes incredibly hard for even Orthodox communities to to navigate, because there is a certain there 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 is. Uh, huge gaps, but also when you're building your your worldview based on things that you put together from the internet, particularly when you're putting things together from the internet in a language like Spanish or Portuguese, where there's not a safaria, where everything is beautifully translated into, into English, you come up with some very, very interesting uh, uh, overlaps. And, and it, it's... There is unwillingness in the community, and it, it does come from what Daniel says of discrimination because of social class more than race. But there is also a racial element, and yes, conversion does not erase that. I see that Eva has a question, and then back to Daniel. Uh, yes. Uh. Following up on Naomi's questions, it's still not clear to me who has outlawed conversion. Is this the Brazilian government or is this the Jewish authorities? So it, essentially, there has been a, a what I would I would call a takana, a, a decision, a decree by the Orthodox um, rabbinate, so to speak, in I, I, if I'm not mistaken, at least Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, to say the least, and conversions. I I. I don't understand why other than trying to create, make it more difficult, right? What that really means, if you were, want to be Orthodox in any of those countries and maybe a couple others, you need to have the money, the self-sufficiency to spend a half a year in Israel or to come to Miami or to, you know, or New York or something like that to do a conversion in one of those countries or cities and then go back home. So that that's my understanding. Rabbi Michia, what can you share? About. And conservative communities in these countries have to abide by the gentleman's agreement because they don't want to upset the status quo of communities that are usually more wealthy, more uh, buoyant, have a better organization or are more prestigious. So uh, often even reform and conservative congregations will only limit conversions to uh, partners of Jews or descendants of Jews within the second generation, like the grandchildren of Jews maybe, or the children of Jews for sure. But uh, if someone comes off the street, say, hey, I really am fascinated by this. Uh, how, yeah, can I, how, can I, how can I get access? Yeah. Uh, it is extremely difficult. I, I would say that you, you need an in if that's your case. So for example, a dear friend of mine who converted in Sao Paulo a couple of years ago and now is very active in our community. Um, he got there because I called the rabbi and said, hey, I have a friend and he wants to convert. Uh, we met when he was in college and please welcome him. Like then he had a meeting of the rabbi and he said, oh, he's a nice guy, of course, join our program here and so on. But someone without that in coming from me, from someone who, is uh, a leader in the community, 
um, they can email the rabbi for as long as they want, um, even in progressive synagogues, and it would be hard for them to get in without having a direct connection within that community. I want to let the new speak and share a little bit more because I know he needs to go in a couple minutes, and then yes. we're going to keep going for our conversation. Perfect. Okay, cool. So here were just a couple other, you know, pictures of that initial community that Rabbi that uh, Rabbi Nathan had spent some time in, and that I spent time in as well. Um, I actually brought this Sefer Torah from uh, New York. It is a slightly pasul, so it is not kosher. It, it, you know, a ideally would would be checked by a by a sofer. Um, when but when I have... was there, it was being checked. When I was oh, well. there. They found someone in Israel that would do a nice thing for them and kind of not charge and so on. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think that safer to ever return to that show. No, oh, okay. Well, I guess it's been it's been a couple of years, but um, okay. Uh, just a couple other. Uh, no, I'm gonna skip this. This was was one community I thought was very interesting. This is an anomalous community, um, as I've as we've explained often. Generally, the um, emerging communities are cut off. They are, are very, they're, you know, in, living in a different, a parallel world to the mainstream Jewish communities um, that we're familiar with. And this was, this was uh, the only case that I know where th this community is part of the umbrella Jewish, you know, think about the like Jewish Federation of the U.S. kind of thing. In, in Brazil, uh, there, there's an umbrella organization um, and in Rio and Sao Paulo and every big city, um, and this community in Natal, uh, in the Northeast as well, um, was a mixture. Uh, it was honestly majority, what did I say? Yeah, majority of the congregation, um, I'll remove the, the word mar maranos here, but uh, were, were anusim, uh, and only a couple of families were halakhically or, or were born Jews. Um, and so, interestingly enough, the spiritual leader here, uh, João Medeiros, um, is not a rabbi, would never did rabbinic formation, never studied at a rabbinical school, but was the uh, more, was the teacher, was the uh, Mara de Atra of the community. Um, and I think here, uh, yeah, we have a Moroccan Jew who's, you know, Jew by birth, and then several folks who, who are not. And it was extremely interesting, um, you know, just over, over the course of, of you know, of the last many years, I, I haven't been in touch with them, but I know that this, it was very unique. Not sure, not that if you want to add any, any flavor to, to that group. I, I had a great meeting with, with João and he, he shared with me that he was elected rabbi by the community. <laughs> and I asked, so what was their favorite book? And he said, the Talmud. I said, oh, you, you speak Hebrew or make you? He said, no, no, I have a copy in English. I said, the whole Talmud? No, just one. Uh, can you get me another one? And this is all the access he had to that. And for that community, that was enough, right? That's how little those communities have that someone who barely scratched the surface of the main uh, piece of, uh, of Jewish literature for them is already called a rabbi. Right. And I think what is unique that Dani was talking about that is one that somehow because of the history of that and how the established Jewish community doesn't care at all about those communities in the Northeast, even the ones that are actually part of the establishment. They never checked them. They never knew what was happening there. So a lot of things were happening like that, and the Jewish community didn't know about any of that until internet came along and, and started making yeah. some of those connections. And I think what is also unique is that as um, Rabbi Chia does a lot of work in, in that sense of helping people convert to Judaism, they were very much against that. So João never went through conversion. He was against that and yes. found very offensive if you even suggest that. He was very pissed with me when I asked about that. He didn't even want to go into that conversation. Like he doesn't allow that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. I think for most places, we've been very welcome and we say that we can help them get there. And he didn't even want to talk about that. And, and just to, to jump in quickly, um... The closest synagogue with a full-time rabbi to to these cities that I'm talking about are like 20 hours driving. You know, we're talking about there's no full-time synagogue in Recife in any of these places. There's a Chabad in Recife, but it's not going to interact with this kind of community. There's there's no. If, if you go to yeah. that Brazilian map quickly, I'll I'll point out to people that in Bahia, that largest state on the bottom, the capital Salvador, there in the bottom, that's the only rabbi in the entire northeast of Brazil. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, uh, very interesting. And, and I think one trend, and then I'll, I'll just pause and you know, see if there's a single question. If not, you can email me um, and, and I'll, I'll let uh, Ramahi and, and, and Nathan take over. Um, but one interesting I, I thing I saw is that many of these communities are, they're learning online. They're, you know, reading Hebrew is really reading transliteration. They're doing as much as they can, um, but they have varying levels of, of Jewish knowledge and education. And Oftentimes there is one elder, like older male, uh, you know, character who takes on that sense of leader of the community. Um, oftentimes I would say to the detriment of the community because, you know, in, in Hasifi there was one, uh, one, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Sewizaki, Mr. Mr. Isaac, um, who, uh, and he was the only one who knew how to lead um, Kabbalah Shabbat and how, how to lead the things. And when I visited, he was actually, I think he had just had some operation. He recorded his, like his singing Kabbalah Shabbat in the community would, would go there and they press play. And that was Kabbalah Shabbat because nobody had learned, nobody, he was the ra rabbi, so to speak. And it's just a very interesting, um, interesting trend. I'm going to pause here because I, I need to, I need to run, but if there's any, anybody have a quick question? for me? If not, you're in great hands with Rabbi Nathan and Mejia. Okay. I just Thanks. want to thank you, Daniel, for taking some time to chat with us tonight and for looking forward to seeing you again soon and hear more stories. And hopefully in this, Daniel has been, how to call that, a um, the digital nomad for yes. more than a year. And I hope you're gathering a lot of stories from these places, also from the local Jewish communities as well. And we can't wait to hear more about them. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. So with that, I want to pass the mic to Rabbi Juan Mejia to tell a little bit about his personal story that is beautiful and how he got into all of it. And for those who don't know, um, he's considered the Mar Diatra maybe like the person to talk about this topic um, right now in the world, was invited to be in Israel in a conference about that recently, especially in Latin America. I don't think there's anyone more knowledgeable than Rabbi Mejia to talk about this community. So without any pressure, passing the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Nathan. And uh, I want to tell you why I'm so interested in this and in this topic, which is I am not from New York. Uh, Daniel Schechter is is uh, and and my 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 twenty three and me is extremely interesting. I grew up uh, in Bogota, Colombia, the son of two uh, seemingly Catholic uh, uh, people, and when I was fifteen, I discovered that my family, my father's family in this case, was uh, descended from Bnei Anusim. Uh, I was quite successful in tracing the family history all the way to Spain, and even in Spain, several centuries uh, within within Spain. Uh, and so, you know, your family to the twelve hundreds, thirteen hundreds, thirteen hundreds. I know where they were in in, in which Judea they were in the thirteen hundreds, um, and. At the time, I was also start, uh, kind of on my way to becoming a monk. So that was conflictive. Uh, but eventually, nothing to do with the, like, the knowledge that I was descended from, from Jews was always uh, something that I was extremely proud of. But because Colombia does not have a very active Jewish community, very large Jewish community, certainly very private Jewish community, I never knew that converting, like I never had Jewish interactions. And it was not only until I was in college and managed to read more and have access to more books and travel to Israel that Judaism really started to feel as a living, breathing culture that was what I was seeking for. Uh, I, I did not become a monk um, because of Judaism. I became, I didn't become monk because the more I prepared to become a monk, the more I realized I wasn't Christian, like that I didn't believe in the things that I was supposed to believe. Uh, and then I was nothing for a while. And then Judaism came to fill that place, but it was only traveling outside of Colombia 
that I discovered Judaism as a breathing, living culture. And then I went back to my country and it's like, okay, I want to convert to Judaism. And this is me with uh, bilingual education and contacts and even in with the community. Like my girlfriend at the time, her stepfather is Israeli. Like her mother converted, like her, her siblings grew up in the community. Even with that, I couldn't set foot in a shul for four years. Well, the papers got resolved. So forget about like learning or entering a class. It's like, hey, can I see the inside of, well, we got to check it with Bitachon. We got to, like, in the meantime, well, uh, what am I doing? The internet was not, it was in its infancy. So I started, I, I didn't know where to find people. I started doing things by myself. And when you go into the roots of, of what is happening right now in Latin America, a lot of the elders um, in these movements started like that. Like they found this book, whatever, they, they, they found this, this half, a, half a book of the Talmud, like the second tome of like an Argentine, and they were fascinated by it, and they, they started living alone. They started living Judaism by themselves in a very... Uh, self-taught, but also very authentic and very pure way, right? Um, I had to leave the country in order to convert to Judaism. I knew that I had to convert to Judaism, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, Rabbi Joao. I, I knew that it was my father's side of the family, and I was, the more I studied about traditional Judaism, uh, it, it, it said, I need to do a conversion, and I had to leave, and I ended up in Israel. I ended up uh, earning a full scholarship uh, for Hebrew University to do my master's degree in Jewish philosophy. And there, uh, of course, coming from this B'nai Anusim identity, I gravitated towards Sephardic orthodoxy, but that went, it, it, it didn't vibe well. My Part of my criticism of Catholicism was it's lack of egalitarianism. It's uh, not addressing science, not addressing like reasonable uh, policies of counterception. And I was just seeing a little bit of more with extra cream in the Orthodox world. So like, no, this is not my home. And that's how I gravitated toward the conservative movement um, where I converted. Then uh, I matriculated in the conservative yeshiva, which is not to become a rabbi. It's just, I wanted to study Talmud. There I met my wife who did want to become a rabbi. And uh, I did not want to become a rabbi. Um, and then it, I realized as the internet started to get traction in Latin America, that my story was not the only story. Just like there was an interview about my, my, my path from like the Andes to like yeshiva. And it was published in Spanish. And all of a sudden, I get all of these emails saying, how did you do it? Like, I, I have the same story. I'm in Mexico. I try to go to shul. They call the cops on me. My name is Maria. Like, my grandmother used to light candles in the closet. I don't know what this means. There's no books. I try to go to the shul, but they, 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 they didn't open the door. The rabbis won't answer my letters. And, and it, what became very clear was that there was hundreds of people, at least, who were extremely hungry for Judaism and were not being served. And I got very, very, very touched by that. And my wife said, maybe, maybe you should, maybe you should be the rabbi that these people need. But there is not a mensch, you, you be the, you be the mensch. So that's how I go roped into being a rabbi. Yeah. She said it was going to be fun. Rabbinical school was not fun. Um, but so, and she is the rabbi rabbi here in Oklahoma City. I am by day a, 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 a interim for nine years, a Hebrew school director. Uh, but my true passion has been since then reaching out this hungry people in Latin America and saying, hey, you want Torah? Here's the best Torah I can give you in your language. Because there's a lot of Torah in Spanish is very toxic, incredibly toxic in the sense that you have 
uh, the Torah that is actually Torah is being put out mostly by uh, ultra-Orthodox places in Israel, uh, very right-wing politically, which align with the political beliefs of a lot of these evangelical groups, a lot of these philo-Semitic groups, and a lot of these of people who become messianics, which took us 48 minutes to talk about the messianics. They're slipping. Um, the, because the Jewish communities have not answered the call and there's no, they're not selling Judaism to people, who is glad to take their place? Messianic churches who have mushroomed in Latin America. And I think by the millennium already in places like Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, Panama, Central America, the number of Messianic practitioners, practitioners of Messianic Judaism, uh, were more than practitioners of rabbinic normative Judaism. And with COVID, the reach they had on virtual services is beyond what any synagogue could ever achieve. They have almost like a full service, like, TV structure for a lot of the video because they have been doing that for 10 years. It was not new for them, as Robert Mejia was saying. So a lot of people sometimes uh, get it. And because I watch those things for work, YouTube algorithms sometimes think that that's what I want to do on Friday afternoon and keep saying, hey, look at this film on virtual services. Messianic, 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 bunch of them in Portuguese who can choose whatever they want more than any synagogues. And they have the talitot and they have, and they're dressed up like the Levi'im and you have like paleo Hebrew all over the place and everyone's dressed in satin, like blue satin. They look like Power Rangers. It's very, it's very, it's a lot of fun. Like, like it's, it's like have music. And as, as, as Daniel was saying, even the super from uh, emergent communities that are not messianic have a lot have a very big difficulty in letting go of the trappings of evangelical mega church, full band projection. Uh, but but the, Jew, the, the Jewish community is not stepping up to show them differently. Naomi, uh, should we just take questions? I also so, have pictures, but I think that uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, a let's, let's not a, hear not Naomi. a not a photographer. Sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk more about like in the communities, Rabbi Natan or um, Rabbi Mejia, um, that you met. Do the do people who are looking for Jewish life understand the difference between um, Torah Judaism and Messianic Judaism? Usually, it, that is that is the hardest part. Like that is the hardest part of my work, in the sense that on on the one hand, I am a pluralist. I, I believe in pluralism. I, 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 I'm, which as a, a Jewish convert is a hard thing to do, right? But then, like, you realize you're first, like, oh, you're so excited. But then, you know, you realize everyone, everything has beautiful things. So I, I don't like to go bashing people's religion, but I, my, my job is to detoxify people and say, look, here is where normative Judaism begins. And, 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 and once you have added Jesus into the mix, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And this is what I'm saying on my itty bitty channel on the internet. But on the other hand, you have, for example, members of like the chief rabbi of Colombia going and playing the accordion at messianic congregations. Why? Because these people absorb all of the unwanteds. And they're always there when there's a march for Israel. Oh my God, they're there. They are not beyond getting their hands dirty and beating up some like I'm 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 this is not an exaggeration. Getting them beating up some pro-Palestinian protesters because, well, nice Jewish kids shouldn't do that. Like we don't want them to get, but these guys, like the brown, the brown messianic ring around the community, they love that they have created this very toxic uh, endorsement of these communities as allies because of issues of Israel and politics. Um, and in Latin America, like Brazil and Bolsonaro, for example, was very, very, very able to, you're having this block that really loves Judaism, but 
does not have what Americans would call Jewish politics. And, and it's it's very confusing, uh, but my job, Naomi, that, that I see is, look, I'm trying to teach Torah in Spanish and to present as pluralistic and non, non-fundamentalist version of Judaism, which sadly, it's like this teeny tiny voice in the desert because everything else is either messianic, evangelical, evangelical, crypto-messianic. They're like places that are actively trying to convert Jews in Argentina and Brazil and Mexico. There, there's still some of that. Uh, so let's hear Eva's question. And then I want to ask Robert Mejia to share some pictures mm-hmm. and tell about places he has been and communities he has been working with, and especially what it means to be a rabbi abroad. Like how can you from here work and be really the rabbi for these people? So Eva, please. So, so, so quickly, so I'm uh, stunned that they don't understand the fundamental disconnect between belief in Jesus and Judaism. I mean, where do you even start to unravel that? It, well, it's they're very smart because when when you're a fundamentalist Christian, when you're seeking for truth, and fundamentals is in fundamentalism, everything that is old is great. So these places, for example, they use Paleo Hebrew, which is the 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 way uh, uh, Moses would have written Hebrew was not like what we call Hebrew. That's Aramaic. When we were in Babylonia, we just said like, "Ah, oh, these letters are so much prettier, and everybody understands them." Let's switch the alphabet. No, but for them, because it's biblical, because it's old, it's true, right? So, oh no, 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 no! It's not Jesus. It's Yeshua. <laughs> and like with that simple like. And if you're ignorant, if you're ignorant, if you don't know anything and they let you in the, if if they let you in the shul and the Jews don't, and hey, the messianic place of worship is in my neighborhood, while the shul is in a neighborhood with a wall around it and like guards and dark people get stopped and chewed away because this is not, you're not from here. So it creates a problem, and it's it's a problem that the Jewish community, instead of saying this is a problem, they say like, "Oh, look, they're taking all the, the they're taking all the people we don't want and making them into useful allies." But this is not allies; like they're not our allies. They like all of this fetishism of Israel of Jews is a very dangerous. It's a very dangerous gambit. Like you don't. And, and first of all, it's gross. We're letting them co-opt. They like it's 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 cultural appropriation, right? The same reason, if 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 myself or Rabbi Nathan would come like to Feber, like wearing a dashiki, like to to lead services, like oh that's 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 kind of cringe. Like this is super cringe. You're you're taking the trappings of other religion. You're taking our shofar. You're taking our things. And and the disconnect is. That you then take to the Jewish community, so like, don't you know, like, the beauty of what you have that people are stealing it and selling it, like, off the back of trucks? But when people want the legit article, like, when their people are coming to you, like, sell me true Judaism, you're turning them away. It's, 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 um, it's, it's a very, I want to show you pictures and then I want to end up on a high note because I'm, 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 I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. Okay, first of all, I want to show you this. This is the, the picture that I show. Is Did it blow up or am I? Because usually when it blows. It's it, so good. No, we can see okay, it. Okay, good. So, good. so this, is, uh, this is a map of the communities that I, I had in my radar eight years ago. Expect the map to be twice as full right now. Uh, uh, um, Yellow points are communities that gravitate towards orthodoxy. Um, blue, blue, blue are places that gravitate towards reform, and red spots are places that gravitate towards conservative Judaism, or that are in contact with conservative rabbis. Like oh, my communities are are here. The map is getting bigger, and 
There's now several more flags in Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe, everywhere, everywhere around the world, there is interest in spirituality. We have a fantastic product. Judaism is an incredible product. And we have been uh, broadcasting the beauty of Judaism to the internet for the past 20 years, right? Since the internet's been born. Here's the thing. The internet does not stop at Jewish households, right? Like rabbis are writing blog posts for their blog, but those posts go everywhere. Like uh, I make like very few, very few rabbis are in the field with a global vision. Like I'm teaching Torah for a global, I'm teaching Torah for non-Jews. There's very, like, I think I'm one of the few rabbis that is aware that most of their audience is not Jewish yet. But even with that, even with that level of non-intentionality, we have incredible interest. And the problem is that we have, um, we have trouble closing the deal. And uh, maybe we can, maybe we can see, this is my community. I'm going to start with my beloved these are these are these are my dodim, and uh, we've been working together for almost fourteen years. This is in the Colombian Caribbean. This was the first Beit Din. Uh, the three ordained rabbis, uh, Rabbi Ruben Safferstein, Zichronoli Bracha, he has passed away. But again, you see, this is not a rich community. This was a house that they owned, very proud. They were rent like like this was their shul. But like throughout the bait din, mangoes kept falling on the table. Uh, uh, like just pop, like this beautiful mango tree. Um, and some people had been waiting for 10, 15 years. Is it Danny in the picture? Yeah, that's Danny Melman. And the store, like many people were, were, were swindled by rabbis. This... This was the community. So like communities, these people worked for four years with me to get trained because they're converting into a vacuum. They're going to have to do everything. They're going to have to be the chazan. They're going to have to be the, they're going to have to run the shul. I'm the rabbi. I'm their teacher. I can be on Skype. I can be on Zoom. I can be that. I, I can be with them for the training, but they're going to have to do the heavy lifting. And you think this might be a fun outing, a program from the community they happen to be at the beach? No, you're looking at the mikvah. Yeah, this is the mikvah. This is the mikvah. This is actually, we call this place Playa Mikvah. This is like mikvah beach. Um, Why? Because no one else goes there, so you can easily go take off your clothes when you're inside the And, and what, look, and I've, I've done some... Some, some, let's say, adventurous toiling uh, 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 with, 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 with my people. Just this is my community. This is an egalitarian community. Um, as you see, they're not, they're not dressed up, because I, I can, I can also show you, like, and I'm pretty sure Daniel has tons and tons of, like, people dressed up like Hasidim. I don't think that's where there's, because I don't think that is sustainable. I don't think the people in Africa or in the middle of the Brazilian jungle. That are dressing up like taking straw hats and spray painting them black. True story. And putting it on. That's their fedora. Take a straw hat. And now I'm hotter. I saw magician top hats as well. Yes. No, I, I think that that Judaism has very little sustainability. These are folks who just want to, like, they're, they're in love with Judaism. They just want to live it. They just want to give it to their kids. And they're living the life that many of our ancestors here, like certainly here in Oklahoma or going to Virginia, people who come for like the small shul with like the 20, 30 families. That was the reality of many people in the shtetl and is the reality of many people in America. And um, and they're rediscovering something beautiful. Yeah, this is our mikvah. Um, this is a community in San Miguel de Allende. That's where we went with Rabbi uh, Freller. Uh, that's where I, 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 I scooped them away uh, to Mexico. Beautiful. Go to San Miguel. UNESCO. If anyone is looking for to retire and you don't like Florida, a lot of Americans are picking San Miguel de Allende, way cheaper than Florida. 
and the that's how they is... build the community. Jews and not Jews moved there for retirement. The Jews said, well, we need a synagogue. So they started one. And that's a blessed community that actually had Jews there to start the synagogue. And then people are coming from cities three, four, five hours away every Shabbat to be with them. Right. Be and because they're American Jews and not the guys from Mexico City, that the guys of Mexico City have this takana, have like this legal ruling that converts are it, like, like it's it's converts are icky. Like like in Mexico, like oh, and this she converted like oh, but no, don't let the kids hear you. It's like it's that level of 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 old worldliness. Like here, these are nice American Jews. Who are retiring in this not in this in this town, and they've created a synagogue. And what they did is they opened it, and now they have weddings and they have kinderlach and they have a, a, so you you can tell who the Mexicans are and who the Americans are. The Americans of white hair and the Mexicans of black hair. That's that's an easy and that's not like racial profiling. Um, that is and this is a very successful mall uh, uh, kind of mixed community. Like and 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 the Americans are very glad to have Jews in the pews, and the Mexicans are very happy to be in a shul where they're not kicked. Like it's the only synagogue in Latin America that doesn't have a guard at the door. The, the door is unlocked. Like people come in from the street, which does not happen. Does it happen in Brazil? Does not happen in Colombia? Yes, great place to visit. The shul is super Hamish and uh, fantastic. Naomi, what's your question? Um, so Rabbi Mejia, I I hear like a lot of when we were talking when you were talking about um, conversion being outlawed and then explaining to us it's more about it sounds like a lot of money. It's oriented about you know who can afford to do this. And I'm just wondering, and if you don't want to answer, I understand, but um, this is a lot of work for you. And I wonder, do you get grants? Does like American Federation help you? How do you, or do you just volunteer? Uh, all this, work? Uh, this is uh, like, the, the, there are so many rabbis uh, stealing people, like, like robbing people. Like the conversion mill in Latin America alone has been running nonstop for the last 30 years. At I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a conservative estimate. You tell me if Brazil is any different. In Colombia, the average conversion. This is like they're not training you. You're not taking classes. Like some dude in a black hat shows up on a plane, might not speak Spanish, might not speak like might be Israeli, might be American, might be Moroccan. Shows up, you hand over a five thousand dollar check, and you can convert. So, so that like that is the, that is the um, that's the weather down there, and because I come from there, and I'm very invested, like I truly believe that if these communities do not succeed, they're not going to be Jews in Latin America in 20 years. Jews are leaving Latin America, like the like uh, the, the Jewish communities are either going to Israel, moving to Miami, or assimilating into, into, into the general population. If there's going to be a community with Jewish values in Latin America in 50 years, it's going to be the children of these children. And the local communities don't see it. Israel, uh, 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 I'll give you a good example. Let's talk about, like, this is Adat Israel. Adat Israel is probably the oldest functioning emerging community in Latin America. They're a reformed congregation in Guatemala. They have been active for over almost two decades. Uh, where is she? This girl right here uh, is no longer a girl. She's studying at HUCLA and is going to be their first rabbi. But it has taken so, like the rabbi is... Uh, a, a, a reform rabbi from Toronto that has adopted the community and has done a lot of fundraising. And like the fact that Rebecca Orantes and like, remember that name because she's a superstar. She's incredible. She sings guitar voice. She's incredible. Like uh, she is the first, I think, emergent born rabbi 
second generation. I was born, I was born Catholic. I, I, but she was born Jewish. She, she doesn't know any other reality. And I think she was only converted when she was 12. Because her parents just adopted Judaism before she was born. And I'll tell you that whenever anyone asks me about the future of these communities, this is the solution. Until the rabbis will come out of those communities, forget relying on the Jewish community. Juan and I do our best. Juan can do way more than I can because my comments are very demanding. But um, a lot of people ask me, like, would you move here? Would you be our rabbi? And I was like, no. I grew up in a very urban city that Arlington, Virginia is small for me. Like this is, I, I, I didn't grow up in the suburbs. I grew up taking public transportation and, and moving around. So I have no intention of moving to a small community in the middle of nowhere to become the rabbi of 30 to 40 people. Who, uh, that's not my personal choice. I love them, I love to visit them and participate with them, but that's not my professional choice. And that's not the professional choice of any other rabbi in existing the world. To the, play, to the point that no one is working in those communities and they don't have the resources to even fund a full-time rabbi in, in those places. So the only way for them to actually succeed in the long term without having to have Rabbi Mejia from abroad, teaching online and visiting and so on, is once they start having their own rabbis coming out of that. So supporting people who want to come out of those places to become rabbis, this for me is where the money needs to go in the long term. This is Daniel, like 20 years ago <laughs> in Peru. This is the bar mitzvah that he did in Peru. These people are third generation descendants of these people. These were Lithuanian schleppers that came to help with the rubber boom of the 1920s in Peru. And unfortunately, it was mostly, as you see, mostly men and uh, up in the mountains of the Andes. And three generations later, these guys are all named like Bauer. They all have like super Ashkenazi names, but you would think that the Jewish community in Lima would be, oh my goodness, Lansman. But once you start looking like this, even if your last name is Bauer, it's a hard sell for the Latin American communities. I see that Scott raised his hand and has a question as well. Yes, uh, so um, I, um, I was wondering uh, to what extent, if any, does uh, Israel through its embassies or consulates engage uh, it, with these communities? Is it taking the exact same line as uh, the majority of uh, Latin American Jewish communities? Um, or um, is Israel uh, interested in getting some of these people to move there or interested in not having them move there? So there, uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. The official position of the of the of the Israeli government can be resumed and can, can be reviewed in this. When pre, when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu went to visit Uganda mm -hmm. five years ago, he was he did a little African tour. Mm -hmm. Even though the chief rabbi of Uganda, our colleague Rabbi Gershon Shizomu, is a member of Parliament, he did not like. Prime Minister Netanyahu did not visit the Jewish community in Nabugoye or the Jewish students from that community in Kampala. You could say, oh, is the prime minister in Israel, the middle of the bush? Okay, Kampala is a city, mm -hmm. but there's not only no acknowledgement, but there is a official position of the Israeli government that no people who, no person who converts in a... Um, emergent community has the right to make Aliyah. None oh. of these people can make Aliyah. Hmm. None, none of my students, none, none, none of my students can make Aliyah. Um, it's gone to the Supreme Court. Hmm. It's been there for a couple of, uh, for, for, for many years. Um, it is, it is. It, uh, let, let me just explain a little bit more of technicalities that I think people are going to be interested to understand. What makes a conversion that, uh, worth of Aliyah? Mm -hmm. So the, the government has a position that you have to have a real conversion, which mm -hmm. is not clear what that means. 
and it needs to be through a recognized Jewish community, which is also not really clear what that means. What we know is that an emerging Jewish community is not on the list of recognized Jewish communities. So people have made Aliyah with a letter signed by me, who the state of Israel, who never heard about, young yeah. rabbi, my name was never in any document, but it came from Arlington, Virginia. Eitz Heim has been here for 80 years, affiliated with USCJ and rabbinical assembly and all of that. Mm -hmm. No one asked that question. It passed like that mm -hmm. because we're part of the establishment, right? Mm -hmm. But if you put Huanuco, Peru, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, we never heard about that before, right? So that's not a Jewish established community. So Abayudaya, 100 years in Uganda, right? Is that established? They mm -hmm. still don't recognize that as established Jewish so, community. So there's an official position. The Israeli government does not recognize uh, uh, emergent communities as official as official communities. And right now, because in Latin America, a lot of the community of the established communities want nothing to do with these communities. They have instructed all Israeli personnel from like the like don't reach out to them. It's okay. It's kosher to reach out to the messianics. But it's not kosher to reach out to these to these communities. Uh, uh, that is one that is one piece of the puzzle. There's a second piece of the puzzle, which is you have these are my communities or communities that I have helped. You've seen that people dress normally and they're and they're like not. But most of the people, certainly in Brazil, they want they 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 they're at least pretending very hard to be orthodox, mm -hmm. and this has led some people in certain areas in Israel, particularly in the settler movement, to mm -hmm. be, these people are these people are eager to make Aliyah, these people are eager to live in the land of Israel, and there's been a lot of um, people that have been converted under those premises and then brought to, to Israel, but then there was a big scandal, and then it was frozen. Right now, from no emerging communities in the world, people can make Aliyah. Uh, Six years ago, there was this uh, guy named uh, um, Michael Freund, mm -hmm. uh, who is the chief. Uh, people were making Aliyah through the through the office of the prime minister and not through the office of that deals like not through the Sochnut. Hamavin mm Yavin, -hmm. right? Like there were people, there were people close to government that were siphoning uh, emergent communities, particularly from places like Colombia and Mexico, like lighter skin Latin Americans, and mm -hmm. bringing them to Tapuach, to Tekoa, to Hebron, um, in many cases, reconverting them there, re-reconverting them, re-re-re-re-reconverting -re them. I'll, I'll, I'll add one more layer to that, that person that Rabbi Hill just mentioned. He runs an organization called the Shavei Israel which has the goal of helping those communities around the world, as long as they are Orthodox, right? So I try to work with them in Brazil. They're not interested in working with a community who is not Orthodox. So that's the first limitation. They do have resources, uh, fundraising here in the US and in Israel and so on. So Shavei Israel is one of the largest uh, organizations in the world working with that, but only if you are Orthodox. And, and only if is, you're like Shave only works with communities that claim Jewish heritage. Sometimes yeah, very Israel, like ridiculously, like, oh, these guys in India, like our descendants from the tribe of Menat, like some very, very specious mm -hmm. anthropological wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Like the, the like what, what Daniel says that I don't care where people are coming from, which is also my party line. In in, in fact. The, the 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 term emergent communities. I'm gonna throw my hat at. I I coined it because I was sick of people talking about like Benia Nusim communities. Like no, they're not Benia Nusim communities. Like there's some some people in Brazil who are actually uh, might might have been able to keep some level, but most people are just simply interested in Judaism because because Judaism is awesome, because Judaism is fantastic and it's attractive and it's it, it, and and and. And and this, by the way, is not a new phenomenon, which is where like, like around this time, and I I don't know how much more time we have, but I'm rabbi, so I will speak until like <laughs> the internet I'll, falls. So I'll, I'll just cut you for one second, just mention two things. One, Shavei literally means those returning to Israel. So that's why their focus is on 
people who claim ancestry because they're trying to help those return. Um, another figure, if anyone is curious and want to learn more about that, is Rabbi Chaim Am Salim. He was a Knesset member in Israel as well. He has a book called Zera Israel, the Seed of Israel, that is based on a concept in the book of Isaiah that Mashiach is only going to come when the seeds of Israel are brought back together. That was a very important concept he used in dealing with the Russian immigration in the, to Israel in the 90s. That is Jewish responsibility to convert them because they are the seeds of Israel that were converted by force outside of Judaism by the communists. So we need to bring them back. And that's how Mashiach is going to come. And this guy have done conversions in Brazil as well, misled by a local rabbi. Um, and of course, it, they both were in trouble because of that. And they never did that again. Mm. But he's a phenomenon on around the world. Rabbi Am Salem, Zera Israel. There is a project called Zera Israel, and so on. So they also do that that kind of work. But so I think one very unique thing to explain about the relationship with the state of Israel. You might have heard the name Arie Derry recently on the news. He was again named the Interior Minister by Bibi, and because he went to jail before for his crimes. Um, he now was forbidden to serve as a minister and had to step down and they had to bring other people. Arie Derry has been the interior minister since the 80s. Mm -hmm. And out of those 30 something years, he probably was the minister of interior for at least 20. Mm -hmm. He's from a party called Shas, which is an Orthodox Sephardic party. And you know, when the coalition happens in Israel, right? You have to say, what do you want and what can you give, right? That's how they make the coalition. So Shas has seated with right and left because they don't care about much of that debate. They care about their own people. As mm -hmm. long as you give them the, 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 the parts that they like, they want, they, they'll vote forever you want. And Shas has been controlling the interior minister for decades on this sense because they want to be in charge of specific budgets to help their own communities. That's what they do. The Aliyah process is connected to the interior minister. To become a citizen in Israel, we have to go through the interior minister. The people working for the interior minister were appointed by Shas. Hmm. So you're not even talking about the politicians and their decisions and the government. We're talking about the bureaucrats. The, bureaucrats the guy who handles the your minister. case. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say that again. The, the, the person who handles your case, the, 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 the Pekida that has the stamp, and goes Juanico Peru, no, 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 no. And then he's like, you call, oh, it's in Bedica. They're checking on it. One of my communities, it was in Venezuela during the crisis. Mm -hmm. Woman had cancer. Mm -hmm. Jewish children going to bed hungry. Mm -hmm. Two years. Oh, Bedica. Not a concern. Like the only way to bring those, bring those people was like public shaming in the media. And and it took a lot to bring nine people home. It, there is definitely Israel is, Israel is not interested in this. And the people who are interested in, in Israel in this phenomenon are interested for the wrong reasons, uh, uh, in my opinion. Because they're, they're, they are all about the ethnic angle. Mm -hmm. And the ethnic angle, in my opinion, is is colossally misreading the current the current uh, uh, point of history in which we are we find ourselves. Every time Judea, every time there is a great revolution in communication technology, mm -hmm. there is a huge explosion of people wanting to come into Judaism. Mm. With the printing press, you had groups all over Europe, all over the Balkans. They were called the Sabbatarians, the Subotniki. These were people who were like, please, I want to be Jewish. And the Jews were like, we're going to get killed if we let you in. Y'all you'll, you'll do your, you do you, Bo. And, 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 but, but throughout the 500 years, there's this fantastic book called The Jews of San Nicandro. In the middle of fascist Italy, this cobbler up in Apulia gets an Italian copy of the, of the Bible. And and starts his own shul and says, This is the truth. Like, I don't I don't want the New Testament with Mussolini and powers, like, no, 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 the Jews are right. This has been happening episodically, but when 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 there was um 
when with the printing press, there was an avalanche. The chief rabbi of Amsterdam was the son of a convert of like this of this Swedish convert, a, a, a preacher. If you go back when the Bible was translated into Greek, it created so much conversion. That if you go to the New Testament, uh, in Matthew 23, 13, Jesus complains like the Pharisees, like, stop it. You're going everywhere. You're converting left and right, like quit it. Like this is for the Jews only. Once you have, like once the wisdom of, of Torah, once the, the, the beauty of the mission of Judaism is left on the shelf, it's going to attract, it's going to attract people. Not only that, it's all going to attract mostly good people. Because, like, again, when, when somebody comes to convert in this time, it's like, you know, this is dangerous, right? You know, this, you know, this ain't cheap. Not, but not in 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 a way of in Latin America, it's certainly not cheap. But here, like, it's it's going to take a lot from you and it's going to change the way people see you. So what 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 has happened right now? with so much of Jewish content making it online, with Safaria being free, is that, and, and I'm, well, you're not seeing it yet on the coast, but I'm seeing it here in, La, in, in Oklahoma. Not me. This is not me, the crazy uh, guy who goes and converts, the, the Oklahoma cowboy who does conversions in places where conversions outlawed. My wife, who is the normal conservative rabbi of the little shul in Oklahoma, has done almost 200 conversions in the 13 years we've been here. Do you know how many of them were motivated by marriage? Two. 200. My like almost the entirety like of 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 my staff. I run the Hebrew school. It's people who are young people college students who are saying like, oh my God, I grew up Assemblies of God in Oklahoma. I love God. I love the Bible, but this is crazy. And you guys aren't crazy. It's happening a lot here in Oklahoma. Again, you're getting people who are gay. And so like, look, I want a serious religion. I can't go back to my church of Christ. And like, I don't like, like, I don't like the New Testament. I really like I really like the Torah. And like once they discover Midrash, <laughs> and there's a lot of people like oh Kabbalah and like that, those you have to detox a little bit more. So like okay, okay, we're gonna let's let's get to basics. But we have we are now at the crux of this incredible openness of of people aligning because of not because of ethnicity but rather because of mission. I like being Jewish in the world. Being Jewish is one of the ways I like being in the world. Like I like spending my weekends with people reading like things in parchment. It, it, it fills my soul. It, it, it Like this is what I want to give my kids. I want to give my kids a, a people that has been up here and has been down here because we know what like when, when, when you rule the world for about 800 years and then all of a sudden you don't anymore, th then that creates a little bit of anxiety. And but, but we don't have that anxiety. Judaism is, is surprisingly anxiety-free uh, for people that are coming from very toxic, even very toxic secularism or very toxic uh, forms of religion. And they come, and of course, the first place they're going to go is to my Chabad colleague here in Oklahoma, and he's not interested in them because not only are they not Zera Israel, they're not descendants, but he also does not believe that these people could ever be converted according to his standards in a place that doesn't have a kosher restaurant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is his loss. We see things differently. And you know what? Right now, here in my congregation, we have people learning they're interested in learning to do shita, people who are writing their own mezuzahs, and it's the converts and their spouse and, and their spouses who then are usually all then also convert. Uh, uh, and their kids are like the most excited kids in my Hebrew school. 
this is what mission, like I, I like the mission of the Jewish people. I like where the Jewish people thinks they're going. I'm, I'm, I'm hitching a ride on this bus. And this is what everybody's doing. When you go and you look at the Pew report that freaks Jews out every 10 years, like, oh my God, the Pew report. The Pew report has been saying a, a thing for two, 20 years already, which is that one in two Americans dies in a different religion or denomination to the one that they were born. Sit with that piece of statistics for a second. 50% of Americans will die in a different religious institution than the one that they were born. This is, of course, people that were, there's a lot of intra-Christian migration, right? Like, like, apparently it's super cool for millennials to be like Greek Orthodox, like beards are back and like Greek Orthodoxy is growing, Catholicism is growing, like Merton is back on the menu. Like there, that is happening, but you're also having people going to Judaism, going to Islam and people becoming, what is the fastest growing religion in America? Islam. None. N-O-N-E, not the nuns. Nuns, nun, nuns, and priests and rabbis are. That is that that that, that is a that, that is a different problem. But 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 no, no people who are not religious, which for America, like Europe, has had this issue for a long time. But America, in God we trust, we put it in the money. We had to, right? Nineteen fifties, we put it in the money, and now America is secularizing. And a lot of these people, a lot of first, second generation secularists, go like, you know what, I. I like doing things on the weekend and I like people to like make me soup. Let's find a community that makes me soup. And we're really good at making soup. And the model of like the tight, of the tight, small community that takes care of, uh, this is, this is a superpower that we have and that is calling people and it's calling people in places where there's no Jews. So as for myself, this phenomenon breaks my heart on one end. Like I've, I've, I like with not time we get, we call and we get so angry, like, oh my God, like why can't these rabbis in Latin America see the gift that is being put down their doorstep? So this does create a little bit of aggravation of prophetic aggravation. Like this is how Jeremiah get, got pissed off. Like, ah, why don't they get it? Why don't they see it? Like the God is being so beautiful, so wonderful to these people, to, to these communities, placing gems, and they don't want them. But on the other hand, the, 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 the silver lining is for the past 200 years, I think Ju Judaism has been very defensive. Like the fact that the conservative movement exists it's like we had to defend it academically. We had to go and dig up manuscripts to prove that we were not just like some primitive religion, right? In America, we had to prove that we're really Americans. And I think we're now in a moment of, of where we can breathe. And our wisdom is pulling people in in places where we don't have bodies on the ground. That gives me a lot of hope in the Jewish future because the Jewish story is just so powerful. And I... I think Eva's hand, I, I don't know. So I, I, I want to stop us for just a second, take the opportunity. Eva, I'm going to open for questions in just a okay. few minutes. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. What we usually try to do is to get with this part around 8.30 and then open for some questions. Um, I'll take five, maybe 10 minutes to share a little bit more stuff on my end. And then we can do a formal goodbye to those who need to go. And I'm pretty sure... Um, Robin Mehi and I can stay for a couple more minutes asking, uh, answering a couple more questions. My wife comes at eight for Minion, so uh, eight central, so 9 p.m. is is definitely my my latest, but. So let me share a little bit of my own um, trip and everything that I've done uh, more recently um, about all of it. Um, so this is a community I visited in Goiânia. It's in the middle of Brazil, really next to the capital Brasilia, which we're gonna see in just a second. And there is one important thing I want you to see that, not me here on this side, but look at this face. You see this person right next to me? 
look at this person right in the middle. Look at this guy here at the very end. Do they have something in common? They are siblings. They are three brothers. There are three more of them. And this main family actually is the community. The place that you are seeing is actually their home, We're literally their home. They live in that property. They built that space right next to the property. Uh, many of them live still in the property, have multiple uh, bedrooms and housing, but very, very simple. We're going to see in just a second. Um, so he is married to her. He's married. He is married to her, right? And he is married to her um, and their kids and so on. There is a second family that is this guy over here and this guy here in the back. You can see they're also similar, right? So those are the two main families and their families have been converted um, through conservative rabbis in South America um, who are heroes in going and, and, and doing it. Uh, others came to the community as well, but have not gone through the entire process. Um, when I was there, they have not converted yet. They were studying with that rabbi, but the conversion only happened later on. This is so here we're like in a stage kind of thing. And here is the rest of the space. They created really to teach about Judaism in that community. So this is me doing some Havruta work with them. This is their sister community in Brasilia, in the capital of Brazil. It's about an hour, an hour and a half drive from um, Goiânia, from that place. Um, let me show you a little bit more of the this is downstairs. So here where it's all of the places you, you might see, like they're, they look like houses. Yes, because that's what they, they, they rent and they make that into a, a synagogue. So this was like the living room that became the main room for classes and eating and so on. Here is downstairs. You can see the stairs here um, where they built their synagogue. So American the, Judaism circa 1870, right? <laughs> so you see that the chairs they have is like chairs for like, waiting at the bank or at the, the mail, right? Like it's, it's something you bought pre-made, right? In a chair store kind of thing, but they built the Bima and the art on their own. How do you know that they did it on their own? You're gonna see that Kodesh here at the very top is missing a Vav. Could you write it like that? Sure, do we write it like that? Not really. More than that, do we write Arona Kodesh on the Arona Kodesh? No, we put a uh, a verse of the Torah there or something like that. You don't name a chair a chair, right? You you write something on it. So they build that themselves. And I want to tell a story about that community that you're going to understand. Does that Torah look real to you? Probably not because it's not. It doesn't matter. They have a paper one. They will put that in the ark and take care of it as if it was a real Torah. And they kiss it and they love it. And here... Who knows what they're doing here? Just want to shout what you think they're doing? They are sharpening knives. You might be able to see two knives and stones in their hands. They're sharpening knives. These are the people from Goiânia. I taught them how to shake their own chickens because they grow, they raise their chickens. So this building here, is the one you saw inside is the synagogue. This one is their house. And here is where the chickens live. And they wanted to have kosher meat. They can't find kosher meat where they are. Um, so they asked me to teach them how to do it. So we got a donation to pay for um, a knife and the stones to teach them. And they organized themselves a community. Like once a month, they go and share as many needed for the community and divide it up. Many of them were being vegetarians until we could do that. And imagine for someone from the Midwest of Brazil, ask them to be vegetarian is actually offensive in their religion. So that's why they were really into it. Here, as we mentioned, how music is a big part of the background of some of these communities. We're rehearsing for Kabbalah Shabbat and preparing. And I actually brought a little video to show with you. Let me actually just share my screen again to make sure that the sound goes with that. You probably can't hear yet. Let me make sure the volume is up.
So where is this melody from? Who knows? Have ever heard that before? Probably not because they made it. Um, that's very unique about these communities as well. They might not have access to um, to the resources we have. I think now with YouTube, things are changing significantly. Um, but they, they just write stuff um, as they are um, with the music that they are used to, with the, the, the kinds of, of music that they like and so on. And beautiful stuff is being created out there that unfortunately is not shared with the rest of the world. Um, but they, they do some things. They know Debbie Friedman melodies. They know things that we do, uh, but they also um, create their own. Those are the two communities I had most uh, connection with and some of the Northeast that then you mentioned earlier as well. I wanna tell a quick story about the, the, the community in Brasilia. Um, they don't exist anymore. So why that happened? In part because of me, I destroyed the community. How so? I integrated them. The, there was a synagogue in the city. What is our goal? To have them part of existing communities if they're already communities with resources. Unfortunately, not everyone made the move and not everyone was accepted. They still have a group, they still know each other, but that community as it was no longer exists. Um, but the leaders of the community, at least the most active members, were able to be part and later convert to the local synagogue that does not have a rabbi, but they are affiliated there for a movement, although men and women see separately, go figure, um, is a very unique community for that sake. Um, and they had reformed rabbis from around Brazil that worked with that community because they are affiliated with the movement and helped convert them there. They're very, the kids are very active in the Hashemet Sa'id, the youth movement that they built there. So it's a somewhat success story in a little bit. The president of the synagogue never welcomed any of them, whether in his house or community. When I was there, I went to have coffee with him in his apartment. Like those doors that white Ashkenazi Jews like me can open for them are very precious. And we, part of what we do, I believe is to help with that kind of connection. And that community originally was a Messianic community as Rabbi Mejia was teaching us about that phenomenon. They have a Rabbi. The Rabbi does not live there. The Rabbi has emissaries, very similar to Chabad model. And they send their Shaliach, their emissary to that community. So they had a guy living there was sent by the rabbi who was the messianic chief of the business. And that guy didn't know Hebrew. He would have a transliterated version of the Torah that he would put inside the Torah. He had the real Torah that he brought with them and took them away when they left. But he would put a transliterated paper inside the Torah to read for them the Torah. And one day he lost that paper and that's how people figure out that he didn't know Hebrew, right? He was asking, did anyone see a paper like this and so on? Um, and People started to look around when the family went to Israel, saw different stuff, didn't see any Jesus things and started to ask around what's happening and so on. And then they became friends with some people of that community in Goyenia, which is just an hour, an hour and a half drive uh, from there. And people in Goyenia are like, yeah, yeah, you guys are going to Messianic Judaism. This is not real, like go get out, get out. Um, I'll make the long story short. Um, one day, the rabbi, the big one, the Messianic ch uh, church came to like confront them. Why are you trying to leave? Like I have my guy here and so on, so on, so on. And he had armed security guards with him. But these people were connected to. So they called their one of their sons who actually is in the army and came armed as well. And thanks God there was not a real shooting in that place but we have armed people on both sides and telling the other to leave the place. And at the end, the Messianics left, uh, the community kept the house and started to work towards um, finding their space within Judaism. So it's really crazy stories like that, that we, we see around. And I, I just wanna close showing a couple more pictures because I mentioned that earlier. Remember I mentioned Solomon's Temple in Sao Paulo in Brazil, an evangelical church of the Universal Church. 
this is what it looks like. So it's very tiny, right? And those stones were brought um, from Jerusalem. By the amount of people and lights up front, it looks like that was the inauguration. This is what it looks inside. This is not the inauguration. This is later on. So you see that inside it looks like a church. It does not look like Solomon's temple. Um, I was seated right here at the very front when I went to the inauguration because this part here was reserved for politicians and right next to it, right here was reserved for the Jews. So I had a special pin in my suit that had a color and that color said that I'm part of the Jews. And they had the Levites who are their helpers in the synagogue in the church to say, here is with the Jews, he is with the Jews, right? And take me to my seat here up front. This is Bishop Macedo, the main bishop of the church. Um, on the inauguration day, he grew his beard, especially for that. You can tell he does not know how to wear a talus, right? If you're wearing like that, you should have your arms around the talus and not like a ghost inside a sh white sheet. But this is what he looks like normally, right? He doesn't have a beard. He does not wear a kippah or a talis, but there is a lot of character making in, in that world that is very unique and interesting. And I'll end with that story. The I went to visit there a second time with a group of educators from my community, my rabbi and my cantor, who, by the way, both rabbi and cantor happen to be koinim, happen to be priests. Um, they have outside of that building, right outside, a um, replica of the tabernacle, of the Mishkan that we're reading about in the week departure right now. So it's really tents put up, the whole thing, the colors and everything, trying to copy the Torah. And the main bishop who was guiding us, he was dressed as the Kohen Gadol, as the high priest. So he had the fold in the middle of the 12 stones and all of that, right? And the others, they didn't have the whole thing. They just had the white tunic, which is a common priest, right? They were just the helpers there. And we go inside that tabernacle. Um, inside the Mishkan, you have two areas. You have the main area and then the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the, the very special place where the offers were, were burned. And he then invites us to go to that second room. And of course, you all know me. I made a joke in that moment. And I said, I'm not going there. I know what happened to the children of Aaron who went there and were not prepared. They were burned. So I'm not going in. Rabbi Cantor, you guys can go because you are Kohanim, because you're priests. So it's fine for both of you. The guy, the bishop, dressed as Queen Gadol, stops and says, what, what do you mean, like, you're priests? And my rabbi said, yeah, we're like the descendants of Aaron. So in today's we, we keep that tradition and we're called Kohanim, we're still known to be priests. So the guy dressed up as Queen Gadol starts like almost crying. I've never been in the presence of a real priest in my life. He's dressed up as the Queen Gadol. This for me is very impactful to understand how that cultural appropriation can happen in evangelical circles, right? A, a guy dressed up as a priest telling that he never met a priest, right? And, and, and the impact that that has and how this is very challenging, especially in Brazil. And why I mention this in particular, because a lot of the challenges we have in accepting people into the Jewish community is higher because of them. We talked about economic challenges, racial challenges, but there's also fear of a lot of things. And one of the fears they have is of evangelicals taking over, of evangelicals going into our synagogues and so on. Um, we do have people who converted in my, my show in Brazil growing up who later made Aliyah and open a Messianic church there. Those exist. This is not the rule, but some of them can get through the weeds and lie to us and get there later. So that fear of evangelicals in particular in Brazil is very big. So the community that the new shared in the beginning uh, in the Northeast of Brazil, there was a local community there that I also know the leader and I tried to make the bridge similar to what I did in Brasilia. And he was like, no, that guy was a pastor. Like, so what? He's no longer, he has no church, has a synagogue, I've been there, it's all good. No, he was a pastor, like these people, they just want to 
convert our people to even like they, if they get more people where a small community they can take over the board they can like vote us out like i don't know like that kind of fear is very problematic especially in brazil for connecting them with local small jewish communities um that similar pattern happens in other places in south america but the evangelicals in brazil I think is a unique case. They are Brazil is known to be one of the largest Catholic countries in the world. No longer, the evangelicals are set to take over in 2030 um, and be a significant majority. But that number started by 2050, and every two years they say 2040, and then two more years 2030. Like they're growing in speeds that are unbelievable. And the to touch on a point that was raised as well about that connection between evangelicals and Israel, there is a concept we use to talk about in Brazil about the imaginary Israel. These people, they don't love Israel. Israel is very complex. Israel is created by the left. Israel has a lot of secular people. This is not the Israel that they like. They like the Israel that is right-wing, that is militarized, that is orthodox. That's the imaginary Israel that they are um, connecting to. The complex um, kibbutznik, urban Tel Aviv, that is one of the best place for LGBTQ people to be in and so on. That's not the Israel that they are cheering for, right? They don't even know about that Israel, but they talk about that imaginary Israel. I tried to cram a lot of things at the very end that I wanted to share about this topic, but I really wanted all of you to hear more Daniel and Rabbi Mejia, which are special guests today. With that, I want to officially thank everybody for coming um, and for sure until Rabbi Mejia has to go to Mincha. We have a couple more minutes to answer some questions. So Eva and then Ruth Ann um, to ask some questions.